welcome welcome everyone to the stoa uh today we have airy in the air uh airy uh Delashmut, uh is a professional extreme sports athlete uh, engaging in activities such as uh, highlining and paragliding uh, the former of which can be seen on the discoveries channels uh, pushing the line uh, where airy is one of the stars uh, and he also has a pretty fire podcast called Airy in the Air. Um, and he's getting into the philosophical coaching game as well, which I'm super excited about. Uh, so Airy's a good buddy of mine, uh, and I lovingly call him my spiritual hype man, uh, as he's someone who has so much energy and so much encouragement. Uh, and just as an example, he, he reads my journals and out of the blue, he messages me like, Peter, you, you're fucking crushing it, man. You're, you're scaring me, but keep going. And I was like, is this, is this what I need to hear? And he, know, and he knows it. Um, so where does this energy come from? Uh, I imagine that it has something to do with his chosen craft, extreme sports. And this session is called uh, Living at Your Knife's Edge, the Wisdom of Extreme Sports. Um, and Ari may be teasing out uh, some of the deeper principles of his chosen craft, combining some of the you know, jazzy terminology that uh, we know and love here at the STOA. So um, how today's going to work, feel free to like have your camera on, uh, get comfortable. Uh, we're here for, for 60 minutes. Uh, Ari's going to uh, present, share his thoughts, and then uh, we just might turn off the recording, have open discussion uh, for the remainder uh, of the time. Uh, so that being said, Ari, my friend, welcome to the STOA. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, stoked to be here, finally making a presentation here. Um, and nice to see some familiar faces in the room. Um, cool, yeah, I'm gonna share my screen. I've made a little uh, slide share, slideshow presentation. Okay, can you all see this? Okay, <clears throat> I'm just gonna start by kind of introducing myself and what I do. So I'm the middle of three boys. And so as a child, I grew up skiing. And by the time I was 12 years old, I was doing flips on my skis. And so freestyle skiing was the first thing that really lit me up in a very serious way. And it was one of the, it was the arena that I learned how to be scared, how to push myself. It was the first arena in which I found my edge. It was the first arena that I was really inspired by things and I became very motivated in. Um, this is a photo from my local ski hill that my friend Tyler took. Obviously as a professional athlete, one of my pastimes is collaborating artistically with photographers um, to make really amazing imagery. So jumps and flips are, have always been my specialty and the thing that I want to do. Um, this is a amazing photo that was published double spread in a, in a, um, prominent magazine called free skier. So from the time I was 12 years old until the time I was 25 years old, I was chasing professional freestyle skiing really hard. And then I learned to highline. Highlining is a sect of slacklining. And I basically balance on a thin piece of webbing high off of the ground. Um, in the silhouette, you can see that there's another piece of rope hanging from the slack line. And that's a backup. So the Highline is redundant. And so in highlining, there's a lot of a lot of rigging. There's a lot of teamwork. There's a lot of material science. There's a lot of, you know, I drill bolts or I use rope to make natural anchors. So there's a lot of engineering. There's a lot of like dreaming of seeing a gap and thinking it's possible and coming up with a plan to make it happen. There's like a lot of things that go into um just being able to walk across the slack line. The slack lining, everyone thinks that high lining is so much balancing on the rope, but it's actually maybe 15% that. It's so much preparation, planning, rigging, exploring, engineering that goes into it. 
Um, this is an Alpine High Line that involves rock climbing up a chossy, just a crumbling mountain. This is the American High Line record. This is 1.15 kilometers long, and long High Lines have become my specialty. I've done a world record project. I'm four-time American record holder, and hopefully soon world record holder again in April when we break the world record by doing a two and a half kilometer long slack line in a canyon very close to this one. Um, after I learned to high line, I learned to paraglide. This is a good photo that shows you what a paraglider is. It's a harness that I buckle myself into. And then it basically is a miasma of lines that go up to my bed sheet, uh, this nylon glider. And this one is an acrobatics glider. So it has a lot of lines. It's very strong. Um, and I can use this toy to fly in the most incredible places. This is soaring. So this is like ocean wind running into these cliffs and going up. And I can basically ride that wave of air. And then something like this is cross country paragliding. Um, you can see that my harness is different. The glider is different. It's a lot higher aspect ratio and designed for speed and efficiency. And I, when I'm flying cross country, I use the thermals that are produced by the sun. It's warm air that rises and that rising air is something that I can find and I can fly in circles in essentially and it can take me up to altitudes you know, I've been to 17,000 feet in my paraglider. Um, I've flown as far as 150 miles in a single go and been in the sky for eight hours at a time. So cool story, bro. Why, why does this matter? Um, most of the things that I know in a really embodied way have come from my sports. Most of the things that, most of the philosophies that I've gleaned in life have come from my experiences in sports. Um, the patience that I've learned from highlining is something that I couldn't have learned somewhere else. The way that I've had to deal with disappointment in paragliding I don't think I could have learned anywhere else. And in general, I think that where my power is in life is often right where my edge is. And I think that's true for most of us. And I think that the things that I've learned in these sports are metaphors that can be applied to anyone's life. And so um, over the years, I've kind of um, made fanciful metaphors of these lessons that I've learned. And I want to share them with you today. And maybe you'll see how you've been doing the same exact thing in your own life. And if not, maybe it's time to start. Okay. So the first concept I want to introduce you to is what I've called the cycle of inspiration. This is like the fucking ticket to the ride, man. Um, it starts with receiving inspiration. Um, that is just to admit that you are not alone on the planet and you are not inventing the wheel, so to say. When I was a child, I saw other people skiing, doing flips, going off big jumps. And I was like, my mind was blown. I realized what was possible and it lit me up. Then I aspired for a long time, lots of crashing, lots of trying skiing 150 days a year, just going and going and going, um, some injuries. But every once in a while, I would just stomp it. I would just totally land perfectly and people would watch and they would be fired up. And I would give that inspiration to them. At some point, I became a free ride ski coach. I was coaching the competition skiers from ages nine to 15. And some of those kids have gone on to win the X games and they have 
returned that inspiration back to me. So um, it's the, the cycle of inspiration is an amazing thing. It's really like the ticket to the ride. This is what I call my edge finder here. My edge tends to be the overlap of what I really want to do, what I'm inspired to do, what I think is cool, like what I'm just drawn to do, and what really scares me. I think this is mostly true for most, this is true for most people. Um, and to take it a little bit further, in this intersection between what you think you can do and what you really want to do is, that's like your comfortable progression, right? That's where you build your successes. That's where you practice things. That's where you can explore. You're not really pushing too hard. Um, but that's your, that's your day-to-day -day practice. Here in the intersection of what you think you can do and what scares you is kind of in, it's irrelevant. It's an unnecessary risk. If you're not, because the top circle is passion. If you're not passionate to do it and it's really dangerous, don't do it. Don't do it. And then between what is really scary and what you really want to do and outside of what you think is possible for yourself is reckless. You're in over your head. You want to stay out of that area. You're, by, by operating in your edge zone and in your comfort zone, you will expand your what you think is possible for yourself. You'll expand your capacity. And so you can chip away at more of what you want to do in that way. And there's one thing missing from this, and that's like how to operate on your edge. And this is, a, this is something I call brinksmanship. And I say it with another S because I like it better. This is a photo of my boy, Travis Pastrana. And as you can see, he's drifting his WRX with one wheel off of the dock. He is hanging on by a thread here and he's really pushing it to the limit. And brinksmanship is the art or practice of pushing a dangerous situation to the limit of safety. And to be able to do that in a wise way, in an integrated way, it takes a number of things. And I wanna introduce one more concept here. Um, oh, how do I go back here? Because, Essentially, 99% of the time I'm on a high line, I wear a harness. But in this photo, you can see I don't have one. And 99% of the time I'm skiing, I'm not jumping the biggest cliff I've ever jumped on skis. Those are some fringe moments. And so if I'm wise, I know that I'm kind of like working in my comfort zone so that I can be ready for the moment, right? Um, in paragliding, it often looks like flying over areas that don't have many landing zones, which like this, this is in China. Um, and really there's no good place to land back there. And sometimes you have to push and sometimes you have to believe. So the, concept here is what I call the 95-5 rule. And that's where you basically spend 95 or more percent of your time in this overlap between what you really want to do and what you think you can do. And when I say what I, what I think I can do, it's not that I know I can do it. And it's not that I know I can do it every time, but I think there's a reasonable possibility that if I try, I will succeed. Sometimes. <laughs> Cause I can do, I can do all kinds of tricks on my skis and, but there's always like crashing is always in the cards. So what you think you can do. So this edge is really 
like when I'm really on my edge, it's a fringe moment that I'm really, really on my edge. Um, and I spend a lot of time in this really inspired, this really inspired place, practicing what I really like to do so that I can be ready for when that moment comes where the stars align. Because most of the time that I'm pushing my edge, especially in the sports that I do, it has to do with the atmosphere. Like literally, if I want to fly really far, I can't flap. So I have to use the atmosphere to take me really far. If I want to jump off a huge cliff on my skis, like the snowpack has to be just right to catch me. And if I want to walk a really big high line, then I have to, the weather has to be right. I also have to have the right team, the right preparation, the right plan. I have to execute all these things. So there's a lot that builds up to me being able to live on my edge. And being able to be on my edge safely and sustainably is brinksmanship. Okay. So the sports that I do are incredibly dangerous. And so that's the main difference between what I do and what you do. And I just mean a hypothetical you. If I crash my paraglider, I can die. If the highline breaks, I die. Skiing can kill me in so many different ways. And so brinksmanship is a very visceral thing and it's a very physical thing. Um, my sports bring me into a type of reality that has atoms and molecules and elements and gravity. Um, but I think that for a lot of us, our world is social. It is financial, it is with our identities, it is with our relationships, and there is risk in all of those things. There is risk in all of those things. And so to be a good Brinksman, I think that this first thing I have listed here is that a good Brinksman is grounded in his life. And I'm thinking of myself here, so I use his. I'm grounded in my life, not just obsessed with my current goal, and I have a meta-awareness of my life. What I mean to say is that if you are a paraglide pilot who is obsessed with paragliding, you are likely to fly in conditions that will kill you. You're likely to push it over the edge and find yourself in over your head, and you can be risking your life. So... Knowing that I want to eat dinner tonight and that I like dinner is a really good grounding reminder for me. It's like, yeah, (laughs) I love dinner and I'd like to go home to dinner and I'd like to have sex again. So let's not kill or paralyze ourselves on this particular flight, right? Let's, let's try not to, uh, let's. Try not to put myself in unnecessary harm. I also respect this 95-5 rule. I put in the effort. I stay current. I keep my equipment in as good of condition as I can. And I also reserve the right to walk away at any time. And I have to exercise that right to walk away. I have to exercise that often so that I know that I'm current in that, that I can pull the plug, that, that I'm not just... that I can still make the decision, that I can still tell if the, if it's too windy, I can tell if it's too, if I'm biting off too much, I have to know that I can walk away and I have to practice walking away. Also as a Brinksman, I have to know what the risks are. Um, And I've had a really visceral path learning this. Um, In the last couple of years, I've been a first responder on a paragliding fatality that was very gruesome. Four weeks later, my best friend crashed his paraglider right in front of me into the top of this mountain at sunset, and I spent four and a half hours carrying him down on my back. Um, I've done a number of 
life flight evacuations for paraglide pilots. So I've seen the hard edges of these sports. And so it just reminds me that the rocks are hard and that I am fleshy and soft. And so any Brinksman, no matter what game you're playing in life, it's important that you know what the risks are. In my life, that's very physical. But in my relational life, I have to know the impacts of my actions emotionally on those around me. Um, and that is just a basic risk assessment and mitigation that anyone who's alive is doing. Whether or not you're living on your edge or not, you're still a animal who's trying to minimize pain and maximize pleasure. And that is a risk assessment of its own. I'm also, I think it's also important that I'm reverent of the people who came before me, especially in the sports, because lots of people have died paragliding, developing equipment and pushing the limit. And I don't want to have hubris that they died because they fucked it up or that I'm better than them. They died because they lived on their edge and that death is in the cards if you play the games I play and you live on your edge. In other avenues of my life, relational death is nearly as scary for me as physical death and losing relationships or being ostracized or being humiliated are very powerful um, risks for me. And so those are things I try to assess and not have hubris around. So the last thing here about Brinksman is that they keep a crew of other Brinksmen around them. This is the ability to see other people, support them, encourage them, push them. Because I love to highline, I love to paraglide, I love to ski. But at the end of the day, one of my other favorite pastimes, it's called peer pressure. I love seeing people on their edge. Okay. And what this makes you, this part of your brinksmanship, it actually makes you what Peter mentioned before which is the spiritual hype man, right? So one of the things that has kept me at the Stoa and the reason that I've built a relationship with Peter is that I could tell very early on that he was on his edge, that he was writing at the edge of his knowing and very vulnerably so. And that was something I acknowledged and was drawn to. So, spiritual hype man, yeah, boy! For me, this is really one of the most rewarding parts of my involvement in these sports is being around other people's growth, being around other people's edge, being around them when they have a breakthrough or when they try hard or when they succeed. This is like the emotional gold in it. It's the relationships that come from these things. The kinds of relationships that I've developed in these sports are incredibly profound because we rely on each other for our safety physically. And we rely on each other to make sense of our situations and our circumstances and our capacities. Um, and maybe I should wear a clock around my neck because I really like that kind of stuff. Um, come on, flippy do page thingy. Okay, so... Qualities of a spiritual hype man. 
as a spiritual hype man myself, I try to know my edge and know that it's unique because at any given day, not everyone is trying to learn a double backflip. And so being able to adventure with people of varying capacities is just realistic. Not everyone is on my level and I'm not on everyone's level. I have friends that I struggle to keep up with in this game. So just knowing where my edge is allows me to not like get in over my head when I'm trying to follow my friends who are even more adept and, and um, expert skiers than I am. And it also allows me to encourage people to live on their edge. And I know that their edge is not my edge. It also, uh, I have observant and sensitive as fuck. I've seen and have been on a number of occasions, a person who has pushed and pushed and pushed people with peer pressure. And I've been disconnected from my own earnestness in that, where I'm just trying to get them to push because I'm kind of like, I, I just like, I'm not totally sure what my needs are. Down here, I have knows the needs he has that are met by other people pushing with him. So at this point in my life, I know that seeing people push themselves and live on their edge around me, it supports me. It validates me in my pursuit in these ways. It also gives me company. It gives me camaraderie. It gives me a team in which I can enact these things. It gives me people who are going to drive out into the desert and pick me up on my paraglider. They're going to haul heavy bags of rope up mountains to rig high lines with. I have to have this team. So knowing that my needs are met by people pushing their edge allows me to kind of contextualize that so that I don't just lose my earnestness when I'm trying to push people and I can keep my earnestness in my desire to see people live on their edge, to see them grow, to see them bloom, to see them try, to see them achieve, to see them feel good about themselves. These are all things that are uh, up for grabs in this game that I've played. I also find myself to be liberally affectionate, radically encouraging, and profoundly safe to be around. This is what Peter was uh, mentioning when some of his journals were just so on his edge and so articulate and awesome and beautiful, and he fucking stomped the landing. That's I need to be liberally affectionate right there and radically encouraging because that's the kind of thing I want to be around. It's the thing that inspires me. It keeps the wheel of inspiration for me rolling, keeps air in the tires, keeps the whole thing rubber side down. Um, so if I can get this slide to change. So in general, you can get onto the cycle. To get onto the cycle, you have to look out into the world and be sensitive to what stirs you. You have to look out into the world, find things that inspire you, find things that stir you, and then kind of let yourself go down those rabbit holes. When you see someone do an amazing feat physically, you have to wonder what it takes them to do that, what that feels like, those kinds of things. You have to hunt for your edge. You have to be sensitive to what scares you and to what inspires you, but also you have to be sensitive to what you think you are capable of or how your capacities could grow. Hmm. And then honing your brinksmanship. You have to know where the edge is. Know what the risk is. 
and develop a sense of courage that allows you to live near, near your edge. In doing this, you're trying to find your homies who push, the people who are living on their edge. And then when you find them, hype them up and let them hype you up. And then as always, don't die. Safety's third and try to look good. A lot of these things have um, inspired and informed my podcast. And I've done 150 episodes of the podcast using these lessons I've gleaned from these sports and have, thanks to Peter and friends, gotten to dialogue with people like John Verveke and Jordan Hall and brought my own life experience of sport into a philosophical dialogue about culture and about uh, what it is to be a person. And so this has been a very fun route. I appreciate you guys watching today. Thanks for being here. All right. Awesome performance. Everyone, let's give uh, our boy Ari uh, a round of applause. That was a thank you. Awesome presentation, my friend. And I really love the, uh, you know, the the modeling, the Venn diagram you did, and the ninety five uh, five percent rule. And it's sort of like, yeah, it, it got me to know you better, and got me to know this sort of like knife's edge concept a lot better too. And the whole kind of the ninety five rule was really helpful. Um, you know, it's like, yeah, get your reps and get your practice. Uh, and, and I'm, so yeah, if anyone has any question, I'm going to ask area question. If anyone has any questions, just kind of put your hand or like, uh, put something in the chat. I'll call on you and we might stop the record button. Uh, but before this, I was looking up, uh, you know, extreme sports, uh, action sports and their definition. So they had, they defined a sport on this Wikipedia page that the participant has a, a disposition uh, to gain considerate skill or physical ability to avoid poor ex execution of an activity. And then they define it extreme. The poor execution of the activity has to result in considerable risk of serious physical harm to the participant, like death or like, you know, serious injury or whatever. And so it's like, that's exactly what you were talking about. And so this element of death and being kind of like near it at all time, consciously, I can imagine it builds this hypersensitivity to have this, this, the spectrum of the edge, the nice edge in an embodied way. And so you can not only detect it when you're there, but you can detect it when someone else is there. Like, you know, like you reach out to me when I have like a spicy entry or something like that. Um, and so it's really fucking cool. Like learning this sort of like uh, having a meta language for like the nut that being at the edge, but also having a, like an embodied attunement to it. Um, but, you know, some people are called to do things that don't have that uh, immediacy of death associated with it. Um, and and so like, how do they learn that besides being around uh, having a spiritual hype man like yourself? So maybe like everyone, they need, needs to have a friend who does extreme sports or something, but how do they can learn that without necessarily having that intimacy of um, a physical death or, or, or mm. serious injury? Mm. Well, I think that there's risk in everything. And like I was kind of saying, there's like a, there's like a relational death. Um, you know, Alex Ebert and I talked about the the fact that our feeling that we get in our bodies when we are at risk of being canceled ostracized outed is like it's at least as strong as physical death so we have evolved to we have evolved in the really powerful way that has us feel those the same thing that we feel around physical death, we feel that around social death too. So but you know it's interesting because this is the this is the thing about about the edge finder is that everyone's edge is different because some people are just more afraid of physical injury than others. Some people are more afraid of social death than other people. And because of that, it pushes your 
the aim of what your actual edge is, it pushes it around. So the question of how do people get, how do people find their edge without having to come into contact with physical death or dismemberment? It is to become sensitive to what you're afraid of. It's to, yeah, it's to become sensitive to what you're afraid of. But the, the edge finder there, the, those three things, those are all sensitivities, right? There's like what you're afraid of is one sensitivity. What you're inspired by is another sensitivity. And what you're capable of is the third sensitivity. Once you have these sensitivities, then it's a matter of courage of whether or not you will try to guide your implement towards that edge, right? Or if you just want to stay in what's inspiring or stay in what you're capable of or stay in what's scary. So those sensitivities, you have to become sensitive of those three things to be able to kind of like find what your edge is. Yeah, I, I love that. Like that tripartite discernment of fear, aliveness, and capacity um, that you have towards a given thing. Um and I'm wondering if we can kind of like make the move now of like towards like wisdom. Like I'm thinking about like, oh, how does wisdom becoming a virtuous person, a friend of virtue as well? Like maybe that's what a friend of virtue really is, is a spiritual hype man. It is. Like how does wisdom apply to this uh, 95 rule? And, and what's your sense on that? When I think about myself operating near my edge, and being wise, it's like, it's just knowing the risks and being really centered. And so much of it is motivational. Um, for me, what has got me to this point has been in no small part a fear of abandonment and a desire to be accepted by my father and brother. So knowing the motivations that bring me to the edge is really important and trying to allow myself to be on my edge and be very consciously aware of what my motivations are on any given day is what helps me be wise. Because if I'm feeling like showing off, then that's something I need to know about. If I feel like um, really pushing, then I want to like have that in my in my awareness consciously, so that I can make decisions. So that so that I can that that it's a risk, right? Like if I'm feeling really frisky and I'm feeling like like I really want to push it, like that is existential risk that is added. Um, so being wise is knowing the risks and wanting to play the game in a way that has you invited back to play again, not in a way that makes you want to win. Yeah, I like that. And like this whole presentation inspired me to kind of like, you know, double down on the wisdom practices, whether it's journaling or whatever, just keep doing it, get the 95% comfort zone there because then you know reality might tap you on the shoulder and say you got to show up in a certain way at your edge um and do you have the capacity to having the discernment in all those areas to do so um yeah so i'm really loving this uh so let's uh let's take in a few people with some questions and I, we'll just kind of do uh the q a format for the remainder of the time uh, uh tom you had a few questions if you'd like to to ask hi <clears throat> ari I uh, love your presentation uh, and, and I can super identify with it, even though I'm nowhere close to your level of uh, sort of physical expertise. But I, I, I myself have derived a lot of satisfaction and, and sort of inner strength from from doing stuff like, for instance, hang, hang gliding. I, I had a hang glider for many years and, and, and loved that. And um, and doing mountain biking and it's sort of winter camping and many times you know when you're <clears throat> on the edge and you know there's no margin for error you know if, if i'm on a mountain bike 
in, in the mountains and I, I sort of look down and I think if I make a mistake now I'm dead mm -hmm. and when you come through it you you feel more self-confident and you're absolutely present during those times and so that that's a, the feeling that one wants to sort of achieve all the time you know when you're with people or doing whatever so I, I guess my question is do you do you think everyone should go through the experience of facing death and and feeling that vulnerability and um, immediacy and that that incredible rush do you, do, you, do you think that that would be an antidote to the this horrible pervasive coddling of the mind and and this ability that humans can ev evade death through technology and N95 masks and vaccines and so on. Do you, do, you, do you think that if more people did what you do, we'd have a saner world? Hmm. Hmm. I think that's a great question. My intuition is yes. I think it's incredibly important that people live in their bodies. And one of the deepest knowings of embodiment is death. Last night I have my uh, neighbors and their two beautiful children over for dinner. And I put the four-year-old on top of the fridge and he's up there with the glass wine bottles and and he can fall off onto the hard tile floor. And initially he's scared. And then he kind of like, kind of gets into it. And that's, that is him coming into knowing of his fragile body, of his existential risk. You know, the chance that a four-year-old could die off of the fridge on hard tile is like, it's that, that is in the cards there. So I, you know, one thing that you just kind of alluded to that I didn't talk about at all is flow state and the effects of your ability to enter flow state based on your body's response to its perceived risk, right? Um, this is something I've known for a long time. And sometimes I feel bored and I feel stuck in my emotions and it makes me want to take my harness off and walk a high line. It makes me want to really wake up, just turn up the risk. If I can just turn up the risk, it'll just like tune me in immediately. Um, but I think that if people were to grow up with a more embodied sense of physical risk and their own physicality, I think that's the part that we've really gotten away from with all of our safety measures in technology. Um, I think that my, my proximity to death gives me courage to face the rest of my life. And I hope that for other people. I think that that's an amazing way for children to grow up is riding their bikes and learning to rock climb and climbing trees and doing things that are dangerous that make them pay close attention, that make them pay attention to what is scary for them, what's scary for their mother and how to balance the, the whole thing between that. I don't think that everyone needs to do extreme sports. Most people don't realize how dangerous driving down the highway is. They don't understand the amount of energy that is involved in, um, you know, 75 miles an hour. People don't understand what 75 miles an hour is. They don't understand the amount of energy that is in their body at that time and how much energy is in a car. It's just a, it's a really disembodied understanding of energy, of physicality, of risk, of death, of injury. It's just kind of out there. So 
yeah, growing up, learning to ride a bike, learning to rock climb, climbing trees, taking risks, getting hurt, all of these things I think are so foundational. And I think that what you're pointing to towards is something that might be missing, something that we may have lost in modernity as we've made everything hyper safe. Yeah, that's so cool. That's so inspiring. When, when, you're, when you're saying that, I, I'm thinking to myself, sort of people knowing their limits and, and, and feeling part of a group is, is so, so important. And I, and this is going to sound a little weird, but I, I, I think through history, people have, um, certainly men, have found this, this feeling through war. Mm. And, and, I, and I just hope that we use extreme sports and who knows what winter camping or what, 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 you know, whatever people want to do rather than going to war to, you know, to prove, um, to sort of, to prove ourselves. Yeah. You, you bring up an interesting point there. As you started, you mentioned that there's a sense of belonging that might be missing. And if I connect the atomization of culture and how we have, kind of isolated ourselves into tiny little tiny groups, then the idea that you would be willing to take more risks, it seems reasonable that people want to be safer and safer now because their safety net socially is so much thinner. You know, if you have just two parents and one sibling and one grandparent, then your social, your, your safety net is just so thin. So the chance that you want to like risk getting hurt just gets, it just gets smaller and smaller. I think that the more integrated you are, the better sense of belonging you have, the more willing you will be to take risk. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Reed, you had a question. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. This is really resonating. Um, when I think about my own life and about confrontations in the mountains with fear and that sense of my own mortality, it's been some of the most profound and impactful experiences of my life. And then I come back to the city and in, in circles like these and in adjacent communities, I hear this term thrown around death work and it seems like there are some practices that people are engaging in that are similar-ish through a spiritual practice to kind of confront that same thing. I was wondering, whenever I hear that term thrown around, I feel like, yes, that, like whatever that is, I feel like I would really benefit from it. And I was curious if you had any knowledge of that space and any recommendations or any books, thinkers, whatever. Hmm. Yeah, this is actually a, something I've been reading a lot about. Uh, Stephen Jenkinson, Die Wise, is just incredible book. What an incredible cultural observation around the medical industry and physical death in our time. Um, another one is The Wild Edge of Sorrow by Francis Weller. It's a book about grief, and it is um, amazingly poignant around death and uh, its meaning. But what I heard you say was essentially that you've done your own death work in the mountains. That getting high up on a mountain, standing with your toes over a cliff, looking down at hard rocks, you think, well, there it is right there. There, you can look at it right there. You, I mean, throw a rock off, see how fast it goes before it hits the ground. I don't, I, I was married when I was 21 and I was in that relationship for nine years. And it took me a couple of years to be a couple of years of being out of the relationship for me to recognize that my fear of death had been, was playing out inside of that relationship. So the idea that death work is something that I need to do became a, a very, it was very pointed. 
It became very pointed. I had for a long time before that been way up in the mountains and dangling from strings. <laughs> um, so it's something I'm interested in to read, but I'm not sure I know how to do it. I'm not sure if I've done it. I definitely get the sense that I need more of it. I also feel it coming slowly over time. Just as I get older, I feel like the reality of my death just is kind of like trickling in to my awareness um, very slowly. And sometimes it comes in a little faster when I lay in bed at night after I've done something very dangerous. And when I'm doing it, very, when I'm doing something very dangerous, I usually it's not, it kind of bounces right off of me, and I'm just like, I'm there. But then when I'm laying down that night, I just like get the heebie-jeebies, and I'm just like, oh, how could I have done that? So I'm not sure. I think that's uh, there is a connection between finding your fear of physical death and death work, but. Aside from those books that I mentioned, I'm not sure I do it. I'm not sure if I am ready, but I share, uh, I share with you a, a knowing that I need it and that I want it. Thanks, Reed. Uh, let's sneak in uh, one more question uh, from Aaron. Yo, yo. Um, I'm gonna keep riffing on the, uh, the death, death questions here, but um, Kevin mentioned this, the, the Alpinist, the movie with uh, Mark andre Leclerc. Um, and there's a lot of extreme sports athletes who have died doing what they're doing, um, like Dean Potter or John Picard. Um, and when I watched the uh, documentary on Mark andre I kind of, it sounds kind of weird, but I kind of like, liked how it ended which is that he died and that sounds strange like it's a tragedy but it almost like it seems like more poetic and kind of like perfect that way hmm. and I'm, I'm wondering do you view these extreme sports athletes who get killed doing what they're doing do you view them as just inherently doing something wrong and like it's kind of a disgrace to the sport or do you see it actually as something that's like kind of beautiful and like part of the sport of like you are playing with death it has to be a given there uh, or else it's not really extreme sports and therefore like death is part of the game, et cetera. Like, mm. does that make sense as a question? Yes, very much so. I think if you think that they did something wrong, you're right and wrong because obviously, you know, Mark andre he was killed on a rappel by an avalanche, right? And knew that the rappel was very dangerous, very sketchy. He knew that dying was in the cards that day in that thing. Dean Potter died flying his wingsuit in Yosemite Valley. And he knew that he could die flying his wingsuit. In paragliding, we have this thing where basically when someone crashes, the first thing the community does is they try to, they scramble to try to understand the mistakes that the pilot made. And they do this, from what I can tell, for a couple of reasons. But the first one is to shield themselves from the risk that they're actually taking, that dying is in the cards when you're paragliding. If you can dissect what the pilot did and find all of their errors, then you can say, well, they just fucked this up and they fucked that up and I won't do that. But that doesn't get to the reality of being a human, which is that I am errant. And that even though I can read your crash report and understand what you did wrong and say that I won't do it, doesn't keep me from doing it. 
I think we have to be very careful with the meaning we make of the people who are pushing the limit and die. Because in general, that that middle fish shaped area where its head is your edge and its body is your place where you practice and where you have repetition. Some people like Dean Potter and Mark Andre, they live more of their life in the edge. The 95-5 rule doesn't always apply to everyone. Sometimes it's like 99% in your, in your comfort zone and only 1% on the edge. Other people is like 40-60, right? Like Mark andre was a free soloist. He went up those mountains by himself. The margin for error is just incredibly thin. Death is in the cards every day for him. He knew that. That's the just nature of the game. And he was playing a game that most people won't and don't play. So I think that I want to have a lot of reverence for the people who die trying and die pushing it because I don't think you're stupid to die trying. I think that for me personally, I get to choose my level of risk. I get to contextualize my life how I want to, and my desires for family, my desires for a partner, my desires for meaningful work, all balance out my desire to be an extreme athlete. That's what I think of as groundedness. And just because Marc Andre doesn't see those things and he doesn't care for those things and what he wants is to be alone and to push himself in the mountains, then fucking more power to him, man. More power to him. All right. Uh, We're approaching the top of the hour. I might have to uh, jump on another call. Uh, But Ari, any kind of parting words you'd like to leave for us here at the STOA? This is the perfect place to have this conversation. This is the perfect place to have this conversation. There's been a lot of people who've come here who have lived on their edge in a lot of different ways. And so I'm happy to chime in on how it's looked for me. Mm. And I think uh, you've, you've arrived as a, not dare I say, thought leader in this space with this presentation. Um, and uh, I'm very grateful for uh, you know being in a virtuous relationship uh, with you, my friend. Mm -hmm. And, uh, if anyone wants to be at their knife's edge, um, you can reach out to Harry, not only check out his podcast, but he has a philosophical coaching practice. Uh, and I I imagine he, uh, has some delicious techniques in the grain, uh, collective discernment there. Um, so that being said, uh, everyone, we have uh, more events at the STOA. Skyler's coming, Skyler Brown, uh, who I think Ari has talked to uh, on his podcast. is coming in on, on uh, Thursday, do an embodiment hour session. So you can check that on the STOA.ca. Uh, so that being said, uh, Ari, everyone, thank you for coming to the STOA today.